Today I'd like to uh, borrow a message from the Apostle Paul because the Holy Spirit said, Son, speak to the people today a message to the American church from the Apostle Paul. And as I read the scriptures in this new translation that's coming out, the Passion Translation, I said, wow. I said, if there was ever a message that summed up what the American church needs to hear and balance it out, it is from the Apostle Paul. You know, there's a lot of what is being spoken in the church today. This is kind of like pick and choose things from the Bible. And uh, this whole idea that the American society is more concerned with feelings than necessarily facts. And that's what's driving all these lunacy decisions that are being made uh, by our government when it comes to the social affairs of, of what's going on in society today, this idea of being politically correct. I would rather be biblically correct, amen, rather than politically correct. But when we begin as teachers of the word of God to just want to preach messages that are going to make people feel good, we're assimilating into the church politically correct nonsense because just making you feel good for one day is not going to change you. If that's the case, then we also just go out back into the bars and get drunk. You're going to feel real good, man, when you get drunk. You don't have a problem in the world. You might, you know, go ahead, you know, you say, yeah, I could do anything now and, and when you're drunk, but then when you wake up the next day, you still got the problem. You still got the problems. And I truly believe it in my heart that if we could get back and just read the scriptures for the way the, the Holy Spirit wrote them and not just make us feel good with the feel-good scriptures, and there's a lot of them where I've come to give you life and life more abundantly, but also the one who said that said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand, and there's got to be a change. So when we read this message from the Apostle Paul, I'm going to read it just right through slowly. I think you're going to get the message, and I think you might agree with me. Wow, does the American church need to hear this balanced word from an old-time apostle, the Apostle Paul. And we begin in Galatians chapter 5, verses 13, and we're going to read through 26. Beloved ones, God has called us to live a life of freedom in the Holy Spirit. And we would all agree to that. But don't view this wonderful freedom as an opportunity to set up a base of operations in the natural realm. And a lot of churches have become just natural churches where they don't allow the gifts of the Holy Spirit to move anymore. The power of God doesn't move anymore. And they're just doing everything through human intelligence. Freedom means that we become so completely free of self-indulgence that we become servants of one another expressing love in all we do. In verse 14, for love completes the laws of God. All of the law can be summarized in one grand statement. Demonstrate love to your neighbor even as you care and love yourself. But if you continue to criticize and come against each other over minor issues, you're acting like wild beasts trying to destroy one another. We see all the arguing going on every time there's an election, and now we see both parties in disarray, and they're all saying things that are not necessarily true about other. They're exaggerations, and they're picking up things. This is stuff that should not come from us or any Christian's life. We should speak the truth, amen, and let God be able to uh, deal with these kinds of issues. In verse 16, as you yield freely and fully to the dynamic life, and power of the Holy Spirit, you will abandon the cravings of your self-life. For your self-life craves the things that offend the Holy Spirit and hinder him from living free within you. And the Holy Spirit's intense cravings hinder your old self-life from dominating you. The Holy Spirit is the only one who defeats the cravings of your natural life. So then the two incompatible and conflicting forces within you are your self-life of the flesh and the new creation life of the spirit. Verse 18, but when you are brought into the full freedom of the spirit of grace, you will no longer be living under the domination of the law, but soaring above it. 
And what are the cravings of the self-life I'm referring to? They are obvious. Sexual immorality, lustful thoughts, pornography, chasing after things instead of of God, manipulating others, hatred of those who get in your way, senseless arguments, resentment when others are favored, temper tantrums, angry quarrels, only thinking of yourself, being in love with your own opinions, being envious of the blessings of others, murder, uncontrolled addictions, wild parties, and all other similar behavior. Haven't I already warned you that those who use their freedom for these things will not inherit the kingdom or the realm of God? But the fruit produced by the Holy Spirit within you is divine love in all its various expressions. This love is revealed through joy that overflows, peace that subdues, patience that, in, patient that endures, kindness on display, a life full of virtue, which is goodness, faith that prevails, which is faithfulness, gentleness of heart and strength of spirit, self-control. Never set the law above these qualities, for they are meant to be limitless. Verse 24. Keep in mind that we who belong to Jesus, the anointed one, have already experienced the crucifixion. For everything connected with our self-life was put to death on the cross and crucified with Christ. I like that. In verse 25 and 26, we have now chosen to live in the surrendered freedom of yielding to the Holy Spirit. So may we never be found dishonoring one another or comparing ourselves to each other, for each of us is an original. We have forsaken all jealousy that uh, diminishes the value of others. May the Lord bless the reading of the scripture. I believe that the Apostle Paul's message to the church of Galatia is so apropos for the American church. I felt the Holy Spirit say, this is what the church needs to hear today. This is a balanced word. Because in the American church, we seem to have adopted the idea that the best way to grow a church is just to tell people basically what they want to hear, make them feel good. In other words, kind of like what they're doing in colleges today, making space safe, uh, safe spaces where you can go and not necessarily have to deal with any kind of statements that are made that might offend you in any way, shape, or form. But the Constitution of the United States never guaranteed freedom from feelings because feelings can be fickle, and feelings are not necessarily facts all the time. But in, in thinking about the church, if we make a church where on Sunday morning we make everybody just feel good and there's no change in their life, we're basically preaching half of the message of the gospel. Because the Bible says this, repent. And the word repent means change. That's the first message that was ever preached on the day of Pentecost. John the Baptist preached it, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus picked it up and said, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Peter picked it up, repent for the kingdom of God, God is at hand. And all the disciples picked it up. And 2,000 years later, what we do have is just God loves you and he just wants to bless you. Just open your heart and receive all the blessings. There's something been screwed up with the message. Who changed the price tag on the message? The message has always been change. Repent. And repent of what? Repent of sin. And that's a no-no in the church today because that makes people feel terrible. Why? Because when you tell somebody that they have to change, they don't like that. And that part that doesn't want to change, the Apostle Paul here in this translation says is your self-life. But your self-life was supposed to be crucified with Christ. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ who lives in me. And that is the point, letting Christ live through us. And I truly believe that the Lord in his love 
and his correction wants to correct the church in the United States of America to get back to the gospel. And how I believe the Lord has shown me and others how God's going to do that is through the persecution of the church. If the church refuses to come out and make statements against the sins that are driving this nation into a place of tremendous chaos, then what God will do is have the world, which is antichrist in the sense that it refuses to retain God and its knowledge in American uh, social um, um, mores and values and in the educational system, then what God will do is we cause that particular antichrist to come against the church and start attacking the church for what it believes and says it's hate speech, it's bigotry or whatever like that. If you come against any of the social mores which the Supreme Court and the government of the United States is saying is okay to do, such as abortion and homosexuality. These things have always been sin in the Bible. And just because in our liberal society, we should, they say you should change with uh, society and be progressive and change, well, that's not the kind of repentance that the Bible calls for. The Bible calls for repentance and change of our ways and confessing our sins that are anti character of God or antichrist. You see, all of the character of God is mentioned, we find, in this book of Galatians, chapter 5, verses 13 to 26. And we also see the character of the self-life. But the American church, and I feel in my heart that God said the American church refuses many, not all, but many of the churches refuse to go ahead and deal with the idea of repentance first. But they will deal with the whole idea of the fruit of the Spirit. Could we bring back up verse 19? Could, you, could we bring that verse back up again? Verse 19. And what are the cravings of the self-life referring to? Now, he goes through this list of these sins. If in some of the cheap church, big churches this was mentioned, this is an uncomfortable thing. These are, these are, these are words that the self-like doesn't like to hear. Why? Because the self-like just wants to go ahead and live its life. It's kind of like go to church on Sunday, get tickled, your ears tickled, and you will not change. The problem is that sin is like death on the installment plan. It's not only just addiction to drugs. Addiction to sin is death on the installment plan. Nobody starts out drinking a few drinks a day ever thinking that if you continue to do this for a few years, you're going to become uh, addicted to drugs. My aunt, who died from emphysema from smoking cigarettes and also died, she was an alcoholic. Uh, she was drinking just three to four beers a day. That's it. The only problem is she did that for 60 years. She was a severe alcoholic. Severe alcoholic. Just drinking three or four beers a day. Her husband, he was a whiskey drinker, and he died in his late 50s. But when they were 30 and 40 years old, they never thought these things would happen. But if you do these things every day, it's death on the installment plan. Why? Because alcoholism, drug addiction, these things are sins in the sense that they're destroying the temple of the living God, which is your body. So all of the laws that God has ever said and set down is for our own benefit. The only one who benefits from sin in your life is the devil who's trying to snuff your life out, especially if you're a Christian. There are two things the devil does once an individual gives their heart to Jesus Christ. Number one, he knows that he can't take salvation away from you because it's a gift. So the second thing he's going to try to do is he's going to try to go ahead and get you to compromise your walk with God. And what you will do if you're a compromised believer is you will seek out a church, seek out a fellowship that will never, never hurt your feelings. It'll be just like in the world today. You'll have a safe place to be able to go where your feelings will not get hurt. When I walk into a church, if I'm visiting, I don't want the, the, the pastor to tell me how wonderful God wants to bless me. I've been blessed for 40-something years, okay? It's like my wife asked me, what do you want for your birthday? You got everything that you'd ever wanted. I said, honey, I just want your love, my daughter's love. That's it. I want my church's love and fellowship with my church. I don't need any material things at all. I've got everything I've ever wanted. Got everything I've ever wanted. So I don't need anything material anymore. 
I'm feeling pretty good. It's not because I'm giving into my flesh. It's because I'm letting the Holy Spirit guide my life. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul said we should be doing. But to let the Holy Spirit guide your life, you got to first deal with the sin that's in your life. It's not a popular message today. But even the Apostle Paul said, but when, in verse 18, but when you are brought into the full freedom of the Spirit of grace, you no longer will be living under the domination of the law, but soaring above it. But it's not grace to do whatever you want to do. It's grace to be able to do the will of God in your life. Because the grace of God is really God's divine enablement to help you do his will. And the devil's always has set these traps to try to get our feet enmeshed with some kind of a sin that so easily entangles our feet. As the writer of Hebrews said, so that we cannot do the will of God. You see, once you're a Christian and you've been baptized and if you backslide, the devil will try to kill you. Why? Because he knows he can't unsave you. And all you can do is end up getting back with a testimony to make other individuals want to live for Jesus more and more and more. So he has no use for you anymore. But suppose you aren't saved. What does he want you to do? He just wants you to continue to practice sin so that you can encourage others to practice sin and you can lead others down the path to destruction. Death on the installment plan, you might call it. And why do I call it the installment plan? The way they sell loans today, especially when you buy a car, you know, it's like you go in there and it's just a measly payment of $199 a month, maybe for a Honda. Maybe it's even cheaper. But then when you get in there, you realize that they're not going to give you that because that's only for the highest, you know, the highest score and, uh, you know, uh, credit score. So, oh, but for you, it's going to be $299. Then they start with all the options, okay? Well, you want this and you want that and you should have this and you should buy this. And you buy, by the time you get out there, it's $399 you see. But then again, you say, that's only $399 a month. Then you realize when you see the total price of the car, it's like, yikes, it's $33,000. That's a lot. And what the devil does, he goes, ah, this isn't going to bother you. A couple of cigarettes a day, ouch. I just jumped on someone, I'm sorry, but just speaking from the spirit. A couple of drinks a day, that's ah, not going to bother you. The key is the devil will always start small to try to get you hooked up. When I walked in bars, it was so common. If you're drinking at the bar, you're smoking cigarettes too. Back then, we used to, in the small bars, we smoked cigarettes, we drank, and we ate raw ground meat. I don't know why we did that, but that's what we did. We used to put chopped meat on the small bars. I'm not talking about nightclubs, but I'm talking about the places where the alcoholics would all meet. And uh, I don't know, maybe you didn't go to a bar like that. I did. I didn't like raw meat. I like it cooked. Amen? I like my hamburgers cooked, okay? I don't like the, uh, the, the, the meat, but I can't eat it anymore anyhow. So eventually, you know, you eat too much of that stuff, and it's death on the installment plan. Well, your audience start getting clogged up, so you've got to change your habits sooner or later. That leads me to this. When are you finally going to realize that God's way is the best way and let him guide your life? But don't skip over. Galatians chapter 5, verses 19, which lists many of the sins of the self-life. And I'll go over them again. And I know you're going to go, uh-oh. Sexual immorality, lustful thoughts, pornography. Verse 20, chasing after things instead of God, manipulating others, hatred of those who get in your way, senseless arguments, resentment when others are favored, temper tantrums, angry quarrels. Anybody say outs to any of these? Only thinking of yourself, being in love with your own opinions. Anybody know anybody who's in love with their own opinions? Most of us are, really. We pride ourselves. Nobody walks around and says, I, I can't stand myself. I know so much. Okay, we don't, we don't do that. We kind of pride ourselves in our own opinions. The only problem is many of the opinions that people are basing is from Facebook and the Internet and Google. I'm going to tell you right now, there's a lot of wackos putting stuff up there that's not even true. And if you don't research it out, you're just passing on lies. And guess who likes passing on lies? The devil. And we live in a whole American society that thinks that it's okay to lie. When Jesus said Satan was a liar and a murderer from the beginning, 
And the Apostle Paul said in the end times, in the last days, that individuals would be lovers of themselves rather than lovers of God. And God would send upon them a strong delusion for those who receive not a love for the truth. God would send a strong delusion. When I notice some of the politicians that make some of the wackiest, stupidest decisions that just about everybody in the world says, how could they make this? Because God has put a strong delusion on them to believe what is false. And yet they cannot even admit when they're wrong. Such as our educational system cannot admit that throwing God out 30 years ago is the reason why a whole younger generation is out of control. Cannot admit that throwing out the very moral system that held American society together, the Judeo-Christian ethics and morality and the Ten Commandments, which held the society together for 150 years, which the Founding Fathers recognized was part and parcel for this Constitution to be able to work. As it was said and commonly known through all of Congress, when in 1787 they instituted the Constitution, they said this Constitution is only for a religious and a moral people. It is worthless for any other nation. Why? It's because the part of us that cannot be seen, the very deepest part of our, our consciousness has to be shaped by an absolute moral system that cannot adjust with the whims of society and the animal instincts of man and the self-life of man. But it must be rooted in an absolute character in which we find only God himself who always was and always will be and can never change. An absolute moral standard that cannot be changed. And that's what we find in the word of God. And what fights against that is the self-life. But in American society today, I truly believe with all of my heart and all the prayers I've been doing, all the wrestling I've been doing, what do we do? We pray, we pray, we pray. And God will bring correction to the church, but it's going to come in the form of persecution. Because the church is the sleeping giant in America. We've been wooed to sleep with all the blessings. Kind of like we're a bunch of spoiled brats in the whole world when it comes to the church. We've got so much. Why are we in the world are we preaching God wants to give us more when 90% of the world is dying of, uh, uh, in, uh, of, of trying to live their lives and long life like we have? What more do you need in the natural realm to be able to be blessed? As if this was heaven itself. We are so spoiled in American society. It is pathetic with all of what we have. We're always complaining of what we don't have. And then you go to church and then they're going to tell you, God wants to give you more. God wants to give you more. God wants to give you more. That's not the message. The message that Jesus Christ preached was repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. The disciples preached repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And the very society that tried to stomp out Christianity with all of the persecution was one in 300 years. 313 uh, A.D., uh, Constantine, who was the emperor of Rome, declared that Christianity was no longer to be persecuted and it was be accepted as a viable religion. And not only that, he was paying individuals 30-something uh, of silver to be able to become Christians because he realized that, you know what? This seems to be a pretty good system holding society together. I truly believe that for us here right now, if we make a decision that I want to live God's way and I want to let the Spirit of the Lord lead my life, that God will, God will listen to that and help you no matter what stage you're at. No matter what stage. We're all at different levels. Sometimes we're really high on the mountain. Then other times we're not on the mountain. I happen to be on the mountain now, but you've heard my testimony. I was in the valley for a couple of years. Just kind of like wandering on earth, wondering what in the world did I get myself into. Wondering how you get there. But you know what? Your father never leaves you, as Jim was saying. He never leaves you. He doesn't forsake you. He lets you get to a place in your life when you finally come to your senses and you start seeking after him. And I believe this is a message for the church in America because persecution is going to come. You don't even have to look for it. It's happening already in society. Already, the Antichrist spirit, and I say spirit, the spirit of Antichrist is basically instead of Jesus Christ. Humanism and atheism, 
These are the systems, philosophical systems, and all the other religions. They're just antichrist instead of Jesus Christ and his moral values. But your moral values are going to be challenged because you can't sit tight because eventually they're going to come after you and say, what do you believe? And sooner or later, we're going to have to deal with this whole idea that the word of God is the word of God and that is it. Where individuals will, will go ahead and teach. Pornography is not bad. It's a great stimulation. It helps you in your sex life and, and uh, you know, homosexuality and just try anything you want to do and you can be whatever you want to be. They're going to find out that the word of God, what do you say, pastor? I say what the apostle Paul said. I don't have an opinion on it. I've taken all of my opinions and I put them on the cross of Calvary. And anything that does filters through the cross and comes back to me, I say yes and amen to but then again, Rob Taramina's opinions are worthless when it comes to changing a soul. But the opinions of the Apostle Paul, who wrote by the power of the Holy Spirit, are absolutely alive today. I choose to have joy that overflows in my life. This is what the fruit of the Spirit is in our life. If we allow him to have free reign in our life, I choose to have peace that subdues. In other words, blessed are the peacemakers. They are the sons and the daughters of God. To be able to get into a situation where there's an argument in your family and be able to calm things down, to be able to pull it together and say, listen, our family unity is more important than all these petty arguments that we're arguing over. I remember my brother and myself, we used to argue. He didn't, you know, it was like he, we were in two different realms when we were teenagers. My, my, my sister was six years younger, so it was a little different. You know, we, we spoiled her rotten, and she was a goody two-shoes anyhow. But my, my brother and I had no relationship. And my mother and father used to say, when you get older, the only ones you're going to have is your brother and your sister. Blood's thicker than water, remember that. Now, my best friend in my family is my brother. He's been there through me for my tough times. I've been there for him. And we say we love each other all the time. I love you. I love you. I love you. Families got to go away from that. You know, like, I don't know. Some people, they say, wow, they're adults now. You don't tell them you love them. Your kids, you tell them you love them every day, whether they say it back or not. You keep saying it. Eventually, they come back and they start saying it to you. I say it to all of you because I love you. I talk to you on the phone. I say I love you. I really love you. I really do. It's with God's love within my heart. You're a part of my heart. You're not just a part of my experience. You're a part of my heart. And that's a powerful thing. So my brother is that way to me right now. Yet we weren't that way. So I encourage you, if you're estranged from your kids or your mates or whatever like that, never give up hope. Continue to pray. You heard the testimony of Jim and Roseanne talking about this. And I remember praying in that little prayer group we had over there. We prayed for I don't know how many years, maybe two years, but we never shrank back in unbelief. Never shrank back. And all of a sudden we heard, shrink back or shrank back? I made up a new word. Praise God. We never shrunk back. Shrink, shrank, and shrunk. Is that the way it works? <laughs> but you get the message. And all of a sudden, wham. Roseanne says, you'll never believe it. I go, I will believe it. And Michael contacted her. Never thought it would happen. Never say never. Amen. With God, how many things are possible? Some? All things are possible. Kindness on display. A life full of virtue and goodness. And a faith that prevails. Faithfulness. It's a faith that prevails. You never give up, never give up, never give up. If you were here Friday night, just told the testimony of the praying medic. Who, um, just an ordinary individual. He was a medic. He got saved. And uh, he said, I started praying for people because I, I just felt to pray for them. He said, I prayed for 400 people before the first one ever got healed. He said, in other words, 400 people, I had 100% failure. He said, then all of a sudden, one started getting healed. Then another got healed. He says, now I have an 80% cure rate for everyone I pray for. He said, never give up. Never give up. Never give up. Never give up. It's like speaking the word of truth, speaking the gospel. It might go in one ear and out the other, especially when your kids are young and maybe when they're older. It might, but never give up. Continue to pray. Continue to pray. You're still going to pray for their salvation, aren't you? Why won't you continue to pray for people's healings? It's like when we begin to just allow the Spirit to guide our lives 
we begin to press through the dark clouds that are surrounding American society. American society has become so ungodly and unchristlike that the only demonic activity that we're really seeing is people watching all of these fantasy demonic programs on TV where we see the witches and the goblins and all the, the supernatural powers. The devil's got everybody thinking that that's all there is. And meanwhile, he's got such a dark cloud. But when a man or a woman of God gets down on their hands and knees and begins to grab the horns of the altar and begins to be serious about calling on the power of God, where is the God of Elijah? Where is the God of Jesus? Where is the God of Moses? Where are they? I tell you right now, they're there. And I tell you something, the line of the tribe of Judah will roar out of Zion for anyone who is willing to go ahead and weep between the porch and the altar because of the sin that is in the land today. And I think about Isaiah who said, whoa, I am a man of unclean lips. And it was a sad time in the life of um, uh, um, Isaiah because Uzziah, King Uzziah had died. And whether or not the guy was really living for God or not, it caused Israel to be very, very sullen. Because it says in the, cure, in the year of King Uzziah when he died, I sought the Lord. And when he sought the Lord, he realized that the Lord visited him and he saw God in all of his radiance and all of his glory. And the first thing he said, and he's depressed to begin with because there's just a sullenness in the land. And I see in my spirit right now that the very banner of, a, of, of this country was a whole idea that we were a city on the hill. And all of a sudden now we have our politicians that are declaring that this is no longer a Christian nation. What an affront to the very souls of individuals who gave their lives to come over here to be able to plant Christianity. It was an imperfect kind of plan because there are still always evil people that come along for the ride when good people are trying to fulfill the will of God. Just like those who left the land of Egypt and they went across the Red Sea. As soon as they got over there, the murmurs and the complainers were always complaining. But God's will was for the people to get to that promised land. And this was the promised land where Christianity was able to go ahead and spore, uh, spring forth. The United States of America sent more missionaries all over the face of this earth than in any other time in the history of modern science and Christianity today. This is the day. But then all of a sudden we're seeing that we've turned away from God. But the God is still knocking and saying, If my people who humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways... And then I will hear from heaven. But it's turned from the wicked ways. Not just come and say, yeah, I believe in God. God bless me. Give me a new car. Give me a new this. Give me a new that. Because you can get all of that and still be miserable. I know a lot of rich people that are absolutely miserable. And I know a lot of poor people that are so happy. Really. They're really happy. Man, Jess and I the other day had the most wonderful uh, chicken that we got from BJ's. $4.99 for this three-pound chicken. It was phenomenal. We had two meals. And it was really good. It was a Purdue chicken. I happen to like Purdue. I don't know what they do to it. Don't tell me. But anyhow, it tasted good. I mean, it was one of these rotisserie chickens. Man, I'll tell you something. It was right up there if I went out to a restaurant and spent 50 bucks for two people. Four ninety nine. dollars was in my glory. And then the next day, on my Ezekiel bread, I had my peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Smart balance on it because I'm trying to protect my heart. I toast the bread first, and I eat it a little differently. I'm getting very sophisticated now because I turn this into like a $100 meal. I don't eat it like a sandwich. Man, I get a knife and a fork, and I cut it like I'm eating steak or lobster, okay? You say, you're silly. No, I'm, I'm real. I use my sanctified imagination, and I can be happy and content with whatever I have. And I'll tell you something. When I have that peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and by the way, it's the natural stuff without the uh, whatever they call it. Without the, uh, they put uh, homogenized or whatever, hydrolyzed protein, which is not good for you. It doesn't digest very well. But I have the natural stuff and everything. I'll tell you something. It's like, man, I'm sitting there and it could be like a lobster dinner. But some of you, nah, it's not a lobster dinner. That's your problem. You're never happy what you have. But I'm content with all things. I love my wife. I love my kids. I love my church. I love my friends. I'm really happy. I love my birds. I love my apples. My apples, no. My, my uh, rabbits. In the backyard, you know, praise God. I eat apples once in a while. But you hear what I'm saying. When a man's ways please, please the Lord, he even makes his enemies 
at peace with him. He keeps them away from your door. But the key is, let Christ guide your life. Let me close with this idea. In verse 25, we have now chosen to live, and I hope that this is what you're willing to do right now as we confess this in a moment. Then we'll close, and we're going to pray for all of our families represented here. Because I truly believe that the gifts of healings and miracles are going to flow. I really believe that. On Friday night, we had a, it, it was just, we've been having great discussions about the Bible. We don't, we don't, we roll up the sleeves. We don't skip over scriptures that seem to be things that are going to make us feel a little bit, I don't like that one. That's a little tough. You know, if it's a little tough to you, it's because you don't understand it. That's one thing. But if you don't want to change, then you're just becoming like the American church, picking and choosing what you want, like a bunch of spoiled kids that just want to eat what they want. You know, we're having, uh, we're having a chicken dinner today with rice and this. I don't want that. What do you want? I want ice cream. You know, three, four years old. I want ice cream. You're not having ice cream for, you know, if you eat your meal, you might. No, I want ice cream. You know, just giving in to people, giving in to people, giving in to people. I'm not going to give in to you, but what I'll do is I'll give you what Jesus wants you to have. And that is life abundantly in him. But there's got to be a willingness for you to transform into his image and his likeness. Not to stay in your carnality and in your self-life and your natural life. Because you will just find yourself, as the years go by, saying, I missed it somewhere. It's not going to take you through the storms of life. But if Christ is the center of your life, in the deepest, darkest hour that you find yourself, you'll see Jesus on the cross saying, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do if it's someone who hurts you. Or if you're going through a deep, dark trial, you'll just be able to cry out from your spirit, I know my Redeemer lives. Amen. And this is the scripture, verse 25. And we have now chosen to live in the surrendered freedom of yielding to the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Now, all of you, I'm going to ask you to do something, and then we're going to go. Take your belongings, take your pocketbooks or whatever. We're going to have a time of fellowship, but I'm just obeying the Lord. The Lord said, I want to bless all of their families. And it's a continuation of the prayer that we prayed Friday night for all of our families, your unsaved loved ones, those that have a need. We're going to combine our faith together, and we're going to split open heaven right now, push back this power of darkness. If there's a power of darkness on your life, or if there's a power of darkness over your family, we are going to dissipate these crowds just like Moses put his staff and that water across the Red Sea opened up. We're believing for the miracle power working of Jesus. How many people that you know in your family need a healing or a miracle? Raise your hand. Well, then, boy, we're in the right track. Come on up here right now. I need somebody to move this stuff here. I can't pick it up. But come on up here right now. Take your pocketbooks with you if you want to or leave them, whatever. But just come up here right now. We're going to make a declaration of our local church for our families, for our unsaved loved ones. And we're going to believe that the power of prayer that Jesus said works. And what did he say in Mark's gospel? I think it's chapter 11. He said, all things you pray for, believe in your heart that you've already received them and they shall be granted unto you. Believe in your heart that you've already received them. Now listen, I've had the Lord answer some ridiculous prayers lately because there is no ridiculous prayer to God. But to me, it was a little bit asking too much. You know, my rabbit got run over, and we lost our pet rabbit. He's not a pet. He's, it's, we have an unusual life. Uh, my, my pets all live outside, but they come to us. And they're all, I think they're all Christians because we have sparrows and blue jays and, and squirrels and rabbits. They all live together, and they don't fight with each other. They used to, but we prayed, and, and, and they all get together. And they're all in a radius of about eight feet, and they don't bother each other. Okay, I've had to rebuke a couple of them, the younger ones, but they're doing fine now. You think this is ridiculous. I think it's a miracle because wild animals don't come up to you, okay? Especially when they're full grown. If they're babies and you raise them, it's one thing. These are full grown animals, and they've come up to us. And that one rabbit that we lost, now we've got, we've got a whole bunch, and we, we think we have one that's pregnant. We can't tell which is male or female. You say, well, that's ridiculous. No, that's just... By praying, like Jim said, he prays about everything. Start praying more. Jesus said, ask and you receive. Knock and the door will be open. Let me get the reverse of that. Don't ask and you will receive. Don't knock, the door will not be open. Don't seek and you will find the thing. Because when you pray, as Jim said, don't doubt. 
and just keep saying, I believe, I believe, I believe the word of God, I believe the word of God. Now with that in mind, I hope your faith is believing for something. I want you to close your eyes. I want you to think of the people in your family right now that really need deliverance. They need a healing. They need a miracle. The greatest thing they need, some of them, is to get born again and saved right now. I want you to go ahead with your eyes closed and see them now. Don't see the problem anymore. See the solution. See them healed. See them up out of the wheelchair. See them breathing better. See their back is healed. See what you want. Believe in your heart, Jesus said, that you've already received it and it shall be granted unto you. That's our sanctified imagination. That's the spirit of prophecy, just prophesying the future. They will lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. So right now, Jesus, we're just simply believing your word. You said it, we believe it. We see those individuals in our family that need a healing in their body and a miracle in their life. You said lay hands on the sick. There's no distance in prayer. We lay hands on the sick right now and our families right now. We bind the spirit of infirmity and sickness and disease if it's in them. And we command it to loose them right now and set them free. Jesus, we pray for those that are needing salvation. We ask, oh God, that if they won't listen to us no more, save one of their friends that they respect, oh God. And let their minds be blown, Lord Jesus, by having a friend come to them and say, Christianity is real. I've accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. Those those that are praying, Lord, God, for their mates, Lord, they to one day walk into this church and be convicted of their sin and walk present, uh, presently to the altar, Father God. Let them see them saved right now, healed and filled with the Holy Spirit, set free, Lord God, from all of the things that hold them back. And Father God, we're believing, Lord, for an outpouring of your Holy Spirit. We are believing, oh God, for an open heaven. We push back the clouds of darkness, Lord God, that would be over any of our families right now. We rebuke Satan in the name of Jesus Christ. And we command him to take his hands off our families. Take our hands, your hands off of God's property. They belong to the kingdom of God. We claim every one of our family members for the kingdom of God. They are saved in the name of Jesus Christ. They will have someone witness to them if they won't listen listen to us anymore. God, I pray, oh Lord Jesus, that you visit them in the night hours to and convict them. Lord, some of the thick-headed ones, God, give them dreams until, Lord God, they just say, what's going on? And Father God, I pray, oh God, that you illuminate Christian bumper stickers and God, that no matter where, Lord, as the, as the baseball season starting right now, when they see the John 3.16, God, just, just let them know what it means right away, Father God. And Lord, let them, Lord Jesus, like the hound of heaven, Lord, Holy Ghost, go after them, hallelujah. And we pray, Father God, you said we could ask for anything in your name and you'd do it. Jesus, we're praying for revival, not only for our church. The church is made up of people. First for our lives, but God, for our families, Lord God. We need to see more miracles and healings, Holy Spirit. So we give ourselves to thee. We believe, Lord God, that as we begin to speak about healings and miracles, we're going to see them more and more and more. We remember the praying medic, Lord God, who gave his testimony. You told him to pray, and 400 people he prayed for, and they didn't get healed, but the 401st was the first, and now 80% of everybody he prays for him. He admits he's not a professional minister. He's just an ordinary Christian. But Father God, you're using him, Lord God, to humble even ministers, Lord God, who'd never seen a demon cast out, never even healed anybody. But Lord God, they got nicey nice messages and make everybody feel good. What's the profit of man if he gains the whole world and all of his feelings feel great, but he ends up losing his soul? Father, I'd rather be convicted by the power of the Holy Spirit in the areas of my life that need change than God to have somebody to tell me how good I am when I know there's still rotten things, Lord God, that pass through my mind half the time. I want to be changed by the power of the Holy Ghost and so all of us and if you want to be changed right now raise your hand to God right now and say Jesus I want to be changed into your image and likeness and if you mean it it's going to happen say it with me Jesus I want to be changed into your image and into your likeness make the word of God come alive as I read it and I pray oh God that you help me to deny myself life when it comes to being a replacement for thee I need to seek you more, Jesus, by praying, by reading your word, by loving you, God, and standing for Jesus Christ and his values. I will never compromise your word, Lord, but I will love everyone, and I'll pray for everyone. I will not argue with anybody morality, but I'll just talk about the wonderful cross that's able to save, heal, and deliver. Bless my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let me leave with this message here, and then we're going to have some time of fellowship. 
I can't begin to tell you how I feel the love of Jesus Christ for you through me. It's like God says, tell them I love them. I will never leave them. I will never forsake them. He'll always be with you, but you've got to get along with them. This is not enough coming to church once a week. We don't have a lot of services. We don't during the week. I mean, we have the Tuesday night for the 20-somethings. We have a Bible study on Friday night, but we don't have something going on every week. Why? I want to leave room for you to be with your family, but also leave room. You've got to have a personal walk with Jesus. That's where you get to know him. Jim talked about he. This guy is like in the spirit. If you could see him, he's on fire. He's burning. Okay, you touch him, you're going to be on fire. He's just burning. Him and Roseanne, it's like amazing. But the word of God, he just took the word of God. I told him, he says, how do I become like Jesus? I said, just master the New Testament. Just read it over and over and over again. I said, and, and it's like the pieces of the puzzle of the Christ will come together because the Holy Spirit will reveal Jesus to you, and that's what he's been doing. Much more than I thought he's ever going to do because I thought an hour or two a day. I didn't realize he was going to do it eight, ten hours a day. But he's a fanatic for Jesus. I think we need more fanatics for Jesus. Amen? Praise the Lord. So uh, I want to encourage you, never give up. Go on with God and watch what God will do. Amen? Let's just grab someone by the hand and seal today. I feel the presence of God, but expect more miracles and healings. Expect more healings and miracles. Okay? you got to... Pet cat to sick lay hands on your cat. Practice on the cat. Okay? Praise God. You got a sick dog? Praise God. Okay? You got a sick kid? Wait till he's asleep and then grab his foot. Praise God. Grab his big toe. If you can get that toe anointed, okay, the, the toe is going to go ahead and convict him because you can't walk anywhere without a toe. Okay? You don't need two toes. You just need one toe. And that toe is going to bother him because that toe is always going to not want to go where he wants to go if it's in sin. Amen? He's just going to feel a conviction there. Father, we thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit. Help us to become more supernatural, Lord God. Not so natural, Lord God. Natural is nice, but Lord God, supernatural is power. Hallelujah. To create things, Father. So we pray for our family, and God, we pray for our lives, Lord. May we become conformed to your image and likeness. In Jesus' precious name, and everyone says, amen. And amen. God bless you.